Yeah, let's rock and roll. Word. Om Sahana Vavatu Sahano Punaktu Sahaviryam Karavavahe Tejasvinavaditamastu Mavitvishavahe Om Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. Word, what's up? Good to see everybody here. And uh, we're we're starting over. You know my mantra, starting over. So um, we're starting over today and doing something a little bit different. We're continuing with uh, the Phaedrus dialogue and bell hooks and good place and good omens and all that jazz but but i want to kind of reset things i'm gonna take my bunny ears off i want to i want to shift things up because first of all i've been rereading this text i mean not just the phaedrus but this this text bell hooks teaching to transgress I'm going back over some of my notes from from grad school and i mentioned my teacher before in the first uh the first one of these reorientation of desire uh, meetings. Lynn Westfield um, so is just a, a professor who's had enormous influence on me. I'm going to pull up the chat. Uh, if anybody is watching on the live stream, then please feel free to, to write in the chat and participate that way. Because what I want to do is, uh, I was go like I said, I was going over my notes from Lynn Westfield, this professor I had at, uh, at Drew Theological Seminary when I was in seminary um, in Madison, New Jersey. And uh, this text, I think, you know, going back to this text uh, after quite some time, I've mentioned I've read it more than a few times over the years, but going back to it, I just realized how incredibly influential this text has been on me. Um, I mean, this text has shaped me in ways that, um, that I, I'm still just kind of uncovering and, and realizing. And one of the assignments that, that Dr. Westfield, um, I think it's Reverend Dr. Westfield, but uh, that Dr. Westfield gave. Um, at the time, I remember thinking it was a little hokey. Um, we, uh, you know, for graduate assignment, she had us do these, um, these maps. Every time we would read a chapter of the text, she would have us um, create a map of the chapter. And uh, Leela, if you'll click on um, the map. So this is one of the maps for one of the chapters that I created. I printed it out and you can see it um, you can see it if I get out of the way, but it's a um, it's a map of the chapter, and I think you can see like these two very different ways of organizing a classroom, right? So one of the ways of organizing a classroom is um, what what Paolo Freire calls the banking system. I know you can't read the text, but you can just see the the map itself, right? Of the professor or teacher standing in front of the classroom, usually behind a desk uh, or behind a podium or hiding behind something. And then all the students just sitting passively. I mentioned the banking system before, like Paolo Freire mentions, you know, like the prof the teacher or the professor grabbing these ideas from the from paradise, from the um, from this um, realm of ideas that that Plato talks about, and just sort of grabbing these ideas, and then you know that's the pref professor's job to kind of distribute or deposit these ideas into the um, the empty jars, right? Into the, the bank accounts, the mental bank accounts of the students. So the professor's job is just to kind of go up there and throw things at students and then they absorb what they absorb. And, um, you know, discourse or conversation is more or less irrelevant to, um, to the whole episode, right? Um, but then this other model, this what she calls engaged pedagogy, she's building on Thich Nhat Hanh, if you're uh, familiar with Thich Nhat Hanh, a great Buddhist, um, philosopher and um, social justice warrior who who writes about engaged Buddhism, this sort of socially engaged Buddhism. It's a, you know um, applying what you believe and applying your faith to social justice and to ethics. Um, and uh, so she's building on that that model of engaged Buddhism and doing what she calls engaged pedagogy. 
um, and says, you know, we need a different physical model in the classroom. And some of you, I know, um, Eric in particular, something we did uh, at Boston College, and I know we did this a few times, um, not as often at Fitchburg State because we just didn't have the physical space for it, but um, but to try and sit in a, a circle, sit where everyone can be seen and where everybody can be heard, where everybody's on equal footing, where the professor is not standing at the front behind some podium or behind some desk, but we're all you know sitting around in a circle. Um, and I, as a theologian, like to think of the text at the center, right? The text is what, what orients, uh, we're all oriented towards the text, but it's not so much the text that's the text is never more important than the people in the room. The text is what just what orients us, so that we're always seeing one another, literally seeing one another through the text or over the text, right? So the text is what grounds us. As long as we're centered on the text and have the text at the center, then we aren't we are looking at the text, but we're also hearing and seeing one another across the circle. And so we did this at uh, at Boston College. Um, one of the I you know I'm always experimenting with new pedagogical models and new ways of teaching and new ways of engaging students in the classroom, and so you know it seems like sometimes you need lecture, sometimes you need a person standing at the front and just you know teaching what they know. And you know I've studied Phaedrus a lot and I've studied a lot of these things a lot. So part of my job is to share what I've learned and share what I know. And sometimes it's best to to stand up and lecture and go from notes and. Sometimes I read lectures and sometimes I do it more extemporaneously, but um, but that's one model of learning and it's a good model of learning. I'm not knocking it, but at the same time, it's only one model and um, and I always see it as like a prelude towards the discussion. It's something that builds towards the discussion to get us all on sort of an equal footing so that we can have real conversations and real discussions around the text, but the text... Um, the text should always inform ourselves, inform our understandings of ourselves, and inform our understandings of the world. And in order to do that, we need to have conversations, right? So the text, bringing the, it's it's part about putting the text at the center, but it's also about bringing the text and its truth into the present, right? So making the truth, making the text relevant and truthful for us here and now in the moment. And that can only happen through our discourse and our conversations around the text. So um, Eric and I were having um, we're having a little Fortnite session the other night and got a dub and um, and had some really great conversations about um, about Plato and about this class and about our lives and just all kinds of stuff. And uh, you know I think he 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 was the one who brought up something that I've been thinking for a while, which um, which is that you know it's just odd with me sitting here and then I'm seeing, I can see you guys, right? But other people can't see you and you're sort of these disembodied voices. And so um, so I asked you guys before um, before we met today, uh, if you'd be comfortable, you know, having um, having the camera on you when when you're speaking. And, um, and uh, yeah, it seemed like that was, that was cool in the gang with everybody. So, um, so that's part of what we're going to do today. But it's not just about that little added video element. It's more about shifting the shifting the dynamic, right? Shifting the power and shifting the power dynamics so that we're all more or less on equal footing. So I'm, you know, starting out with some discourse and some setup, but I hope uh, we'll spend most of this time just in dialogue and conversation with one another. And, you know, that it may begin with the text and it may come back to the text, but... Um, there's something that I say, I think you've you've heard it as a mantra in all of my classes uh, with great frequency, almost almost as often as the circle uh, metaphor. But um, one thing I say frequently is that truth is always true, right? Truth is always true. If it is truth, it is always true. If it's not true, then it's not truth, right? And um, so one of the one of the passages in the first part of this text, uh, the Phaedrus dialogue, but there's a con this conversation between Phaedrus and Socrates, and they're talking about myth. And uh, just to kind of recap what I was saying last week, uh, you know, I've been reading the the introduction um, to this text. There's a the introduction by Alexander Nehemiah and Paul Woodruff, and um, in part they're talking about what. If you were to try and boil this text down, it's it's difficult for scholars to kind of say what the text is about because 
it's in these two major sections, right? The first section has these three, you know, two or three speeches, depending on how you count them. Um, I count them as two. There's one by uh, Lysias, which is read by Phaedrus. And then Socrates has a very long speech, which is kind of divided into two parts. And some people look at it as two speeches, um, but it's really, I think, one large speech divided into two different pieces. And then after they have these um, these speeches, which are all about eros, all about erotic love um, or desire, is the way we've been uh, translating it most of this uh, past couple of classes. Um, after that, then they have a conversation about the speeches. But their conversation isn't so much about the content of the speeches, but instead about logic and rhetoric. And uh, so, as I said last week, you know, um, from Socrates' perspective, there we have this um, tripart what the, what's called the tripartite soul, right? You have one soul, but the soul is intellect, which makes decisions. It's like the charioteer, and then you have these two horses: the horse of logic and the horse of desire. And Socrates is very clear, like the horse of logic, it always does, does what you say, right? You tell it to do something and it does it. It minds very well and it, and it gives you information, but it doesn't ever demand anything. It just sort of like, you know, it's really in sync more or less with the, with the intellect. But then there's the horse of desire and the horse of desire does whatever the hell it wants to do, right? That's, that's what desire is. Desire drives and desire does what it wants. And that we can think about this in terms of, um, mind and heart, right? Or emotions and, or mind and body, but really mind and, and heart, right? I think heart and mind together um, are, are a good way to think about this tripartite soul. And the intellect, again, is that which makes decisions between the two. Because Socrates at one point says, you know, they're, they're sometimes in agreement, right? And, but oftentimes they're not in agreement. And when they're not in agreement, sometimes the charioteer can guide the soul away from where desire wants. But most of the time, the horse of desire, it wins, right? It gets its way, it does what it wants. And so um, I think the one way to understand the text as a whole and what, what the main point uh, that Socrates is trying to make is that there are different ways of speaking. Uh, and since we're focused on pedagogy, we can think of different ways of teaching, right? And so one way of teaching, maybe, maybe more or less uh, in sync with that, what I was talking about a minute ago, standing in front of the classroom, kind of lecturing or giving notes as I'm doing right now, um, that sort of, yeah, top-down banking system, throwing information at people, that's really, that feeds the logic course, right? That, that appeals to that rational mind. It appeals to the horse of logic. It's, it's good. There's nothing bad about that stuff, right? It's good. Um, but then there's another form of dialogue, another form of discourse, which is rhetoric. And the terms in Greek, um, Rome and Eros are closely related etymologically. Um, you know, the, the root meaning of the words are closely related. And uh, as Socrates defines Eros in his first speech, we'll look at next week, but uh, or the first part of his speech, as a force, a force that drives the soul, right? So there's these, both horses drive the soul, logic and reason and uh, desire, but that, you know, when you're speaking, rhetoric speaks to the soul. And so I think one of the ways that my my thinking my thinking about this text um, has changed uh, over the years through my dialogues with people like Nick and people like Harry and so many other students that um, that have read this text with me over the years. One of the ways, you know, when I first read the text, I was like, all right, rhetoric and logic. What the hell's rhetoric? I went and looked up rhetoric in the dictionary. Right? What does rhetoric mean? What is what do we mean by rhetoric? What does the word mean? And so then I came in with that understanding. All right, rhetoric means this. And so let's talk about, let's define rhetoric. And then let's see what Socrates is trying to say about rhetoric and logic. Now, though, um, especially this time reading it, I, I look at, I approach it from a very, very different perspective, which is that rhetoric is not something which Socrates is talking about. But instead, Socrates is giving us a very clear definition of rhetoric. And the re his definition is rhetoric is that which speaks to the heart, right? It speaks to the soul. It speaks to that that aspect of desire. And so anything that that meets that definition is rhetoric. 
And anything that doesn't meet that definition, hopefully, is logic and reason, right? Um, so you have these sort of these two ways of discoursing. In this clip, and there's a lot to talk about in this in this little clip, um, but one of the things Socrates talks about myth, and um, so I just want to set up the clip before uh, before we play it. Which many times in my religious courses, and my philosophy courses, and my theology courses as a really excellent discourse about myth and what myth is. And I think um, Eric probably remembers um, my, my um, you know, little series, mini series of lectures on myth, where we talk about the three little pigs and talk about Rosa Parks and the definition of myth. Whether or not a story is true, like historically true, is irrelevant to whether or not it's a myth. So p part of what I, I have, I can give a link. I've got some of those video, I've got, those lectures on YouTube, so you can go and watch those other lectures where I talk about um, Rosa Parks and um, Merce Eliade and all sorts of theorists on myth. Uh, and I reference um, Socrates in this passage from Phaedrus. And Phaedrus says, but tell me, Socrates, in the name of Zeus, do you really believe that legend is true? It's asking about a myth and saying, do you think that myth is really true? But um, but what, ma what makes a myth myth is that it, it conveys a particular truth. And I think here we can see Socrates saying, it's not just any kind of truth, but it's a truth that speaks to the heart. It's a truth that speaks to our desire. It's a truth that speaks to that part of the soul that drives the soul, that moves the soul. It's a force within us that compels us in a particular direction. And it's a very, very strong force. Whether or not that myth is true, is irrelevant. This is why I do not concern myself with whether or not myths are true. I accept what is generally believed, and as I was just saying, I look not into the myths, right, whether or not the myths are true, but instead I look into myself. Am I a beast more complicated and savage than Typhon? Or am I a tamer, simpler animal with a share in a divine and gentle nature? What matters is the truth that is true. I don't know. I know it sounds. It's a little bit of double speech, right? I'm saying what well, doesn't matter if the story is true. What matters is if the truth is true, right? If it's conveying a particular truth, then that truth will be true always, right? It's always true. And it's a little bit of an irony to say, well, it's a truth that's conveyed through a myth that isn't true, but nevertheless, the truth is true in every context, including in the myth. Um, and so uh, I know that sounds like philosophical, just bumbo jumbo, like what the hell are you saying? Sounds like you're talking out of both sides of your mouth and maybe I am. Anyway, so let's, let's go to this, uh, let's go to this clip because he talks about whether or not this particular myth uh, is true or not. Lead the way then and find us a place to sit. Do you see that very tall plane tree? Of course. It's shady with a light breeze. We can sit. Or if you prefer, lie down on the grass there. Lead on then. Tell me, Socrates, isn't it from somewhere near this place that this near this stretch of the Ilias that people say Boreas carried Orthuia away? That's what they say. Couldn't this be the very spot? The stream is lovely, pure, and clear, just right for girls to be playing nearby. No, it's two or three hundred yards farther downstream, where one crosses to get to the district of Agra. I think there's even an altar to Boreas there. I hadn't noticed it, but tell me, Socrates, in the name of Zeus, do you really believe that legend is true? Actually, it wouldn't be out of place for me to reject it, as our intellectuals do. I could then tell a clever story. I could claim that a gust of the north wind blew her over the rocks where she was playing with Pharmacia, and when she was killed that way, people said she had been carried off by Boreas. Or was it perhaps from the Areopagus? The story is also told that she was carried away from there instead. Now, Phaedrus, such explanations are amusing enough, but they're a job for a man I cannot envy at all. He'd have to be far too ingenious and work too hard, mainly because after that, he will have to go on to give a rational account of the form of the Hippocentaurs, and then of the Chimera, and a whole flood of Gorgons and Pegasus and other monsters in large numbers and absurd forms will overwhelm him. 
Anyone who does not believe in them, who wants to explain them away and make them plausible by means of some sort of rough ingenuity, will need a great deal of time. But I have no time for such things. And the reason, my friend, is this. I am still unable, as the Delphic inscription orders, to know myself. And it really seems ridiculous to look into other things before I have understood that. This is why I don't concern myself with them. I accept what is generally believed. And as I was just saying, I won't look into them, but into myself. Am I a beast more complicated and savage than Typhon? Or am I a tamer, simpler animal with a share in a divine and gentle nature? Well, look, my friend, while we were talking, haven't we reached the tree that you were taking us to? That's the one. By Hera, it really is a beautiful resting place. The plane tree is tall and very broad. The chaste tree, high as it is, is wonderfully shady. And since it is in full bloom, the whole place is filled with its fragrance. From under the plane tree, the loveliest spring runs with very cool water. Our feet can testify to that. The place appears to be dedicated to Achilles or and some of the nymphs if we can judge from the statues and the votive offerings. Feel the freshness of the air, how pretty and pleasant it is, how it echoes with the summery sweet song of the cicadas' chorus. The most exquisite thing of all, of course, is this grassy slope. It rises so gently, you can rest your head on it perfectly when you lie down on it. All right, so uh, this time around when I was reading it uh, and reading the, the entire text, not just the, the first portion as I so um, obsessively, compulsively focus on, um, you know, when I was reading the, the discourse, the dialogue on rhetoric and logic in the second half of the, um, of the text, Socrates brings up the cicadas again, which, uh, which just kind of struck my, my notice. Uh, and in the second half, he describes the cicadas, you know, the, like the locusts, um, cicadas, locusts. And so he was describing the, I, I'm, I'm from South Carolina, so um, that's one of the things that I, that I miss quite a lot uh, about South Carolina is the cicadas. And so we'll go down there and the locusts just, especially in my parents' house, it's just, uh, it's sometimes quite deafening, actually. It's very, very loud. Um, there's just so, so many of them in there. Um, yeah, but uh, here it's the peepers. Here we just have last night, so this first time um, of this year where we have the peepers, you know, the little, what are they, just like little frogs, right? Little frogs that are, they call them peepers, but they're really, really loud. And anyway, so it was the first night last night. But in the second half of the text, he brings up the cicadas again um, and doesn't explicitly link these two. But he tells another myth there and says, re refers to the myth of the cicadas. Uh, he refers to a myth that says that our ancestors, the ancestors, those who have gone before us, are, are, you know, you could look at when we talk about ancestors, we're talking about, I mean, certainly people like Rosa Parks and Martin Luther King and George Washington and Abraham Lincoln and so many of other ancestors, the people who came before us that created the world um, of which we are a part now and he says those ancestors they don't just go away but they stick around and they they sing to us through the songs of the cicadas so the, the cicadas then represent our ancestors that are listening to us and in this passage here where he brings it up for the first time um, that we just saw they inspire right so they inspire which is a way of speaking to the soul speaking to the heart and speaking to the heart and the soul in a way that inspires right so that the spirit of those ancestors, the spirit of Martin Luther King, the spirit of Abraham Lincoln, the spirit of Rosa Parks, those spirits come into us and they possess us in a form of, you know, um, spiritual possession, right? So they, it's a form of madness, which is a, um, this, this text uh, elaborates quite a bit on madness. And that's one of the things that uh, I don't want to get too far afield, but Lysias talks about the madness that comes from erotic love. And then the first part of Socrates' speech, he talks about the madness from erotic love. 
But then the second part, he talks about a different kind of madness that comes from erotic love, which is that er that madness of being inspired, being possessed by God, right? Being possessed by our ancestors that takes us over. I, I, I'm already talking too long and, and have much more to say, but I want to end my little intro with this. All these things in my mind are related. Hopefully you'll agree. One of the things when I when I think back, I, I did confirm, by the way, that uh, that I did have Eric and um, Nick at the same time. I had Eric in a year long course at Boston College called the Religious Quest. And so I had him uh, in fall semester and spring semester. And I had Nick only in the spring semester of that year. And um, but both of you, um, both of you, I mean, both not just you two, but uh, so many people in those classes um, had uh, a deep impact on me, an inspiration uh, in this, in the way that we're, you know, seeing echoed in this text somewhat. But, um, and that inspiration led to um, a, a book chapter that I wrote, which unfortunately has not been published because the editor has, uh, has fallen ill, but um, I, I need to just publish it. Maybe I'll just publish it on YouTube. Um, but uh, but it's a text that, it's a text that also I think is inspired by bell hooks and absolutely inspired by um, by this text is actually more inspired by Plato's allegory of the cave. But one of the things that that bell hooks emphasizes is that if we want to transform the world in which we live, right? If we're if you are happy with the world as it is, then probably there's not much you can learn from me. Right. But if you're looking at the world in which we live and you watch the news and you read the stories and you see the world the way that it is and you think, man, some shit's got to change. Right. We've got to transform how we interact with one another. We've got to transform how we think about our neighbors. We've got to transform how we interact and what motivates us, what does what desire drives us in this world. If you if you feel that our world needs to transform or needs to be changed and if you feel that you have a role to play in that to you know that we all have a role to play in that then one of the arguments the bell hooks bringing back that engaged pedagogy and that that model of the circle um and the transforming the classroom that simple change right from um pull up the map again leah if you would but uh that simple change from that sort of banking system it's like reverse for me so the banking system right where you're just like um the the professor standing in front and just depositing information so there's a hierarchy right one person at the top and then everybody else below right so you have master and slave or you have teacher and student or you have the um person who's giving the grades and the purpose you know it's a it's a transaction it's exchange and it's a hierarchy whereas on the other model right it's a radically transformed non-hierarchical model a circle right where everyone has a role to play in that and the the point that hooks and paulo freire and i deeply believe uh socrates and plato the the point that all of them are trying to make is that when we are teaching right when we are engaged in teaching especially uh, but also learning but especially in the teaching aspect then it's not just the information or the knowledge that we're passing along. That's important, right? No doubt that's important. That's why I've been talking for half an hour. Um, so it's not just the information or the knowledge that we're passing along that speaks to that rational intellectual side of the soul, but it's also the way that we have, uh, the, the way that we conduct class, right? The, the classroom, and so this is going back to that paper that I, that book chapter that I wrote that was informed um, by by uh, my students, but more than anything by my students um, and the various classes that I've taught over the years, where I have been deeply inspired by my students and learn from my students and learned that every classroom, right, has something to teach me. Every student has something to teach me. And not only that, but when I pass that power on to the students, it literally is empowering, right? It transforms the students, it transforms the dynamic, and it transforms how students think about the students sitting next to them, right? It transforms how they think about how we work together, how we fit together, 
And that, that sort of teamwork, that sort of collaborative effort, that engaged pedagogy where everybody is in this together, right? That is as transformal, transformative, if not more transformative than any knowledge or information I could possibly pa pass on to the students, right? So in other words, just kind of put it in aphoristically, right? It's not just what we teach, but how that learning takes place, right? If it takes place in a, in a place where everybody in the room is empowered, and empowered in different ways, of course, right? The professor is always going to be empowered in a different way than the students. Uh, and different students coming from different ba backgrounds are going to be empowered in different ways. It's not about everybody having the same power, but everybody being empowered in their own particular way. Everybody having an equal voice, everybody having something, um, not just an opportunity to contribute something, but an expectation to contribute something, a responsibility to respond as they are able, right? Um, which is what the word responsibility means. Um, so with that, my responsibility at this point then is to shift the um, shift the focus and shift everything away from here and me and this body to you and your minds and your bodies out there. And at some point, maybe at the end of this or some other time, we can talk about just the, the sort of twisted aspect of doing this in a very disembodied way through this virtual space and lear virtual learning and that kind of stuff since we're not physically in a classroom but um but that's a a, a related issue but a separate issue um well slightly separate um but anyway let me um l let me set up um carrie if i could if i can put you on the spot a little bit um, and uh, we'll start with with Carrie because uh, we were snapchatting um, you know I don't do much I don't like texting or emailing or really any form of communication other than snapchat um, uh, for various reasons we can unpack that psychologically for lots of different ways but um, but we were chatting over snapchat and she mentioned this um, this uh i think it was right after the last class so it was maybe last thursday when you brought it up it was right after the last class and uh um yeah it just absolutely blew my mind so i'm not going to steal your thunder but i'm going to pass it over to you because it was also about yeah that's right yeah i'm sorry i'm getting uh instructions in my ear but um but yeah let's let's shift it over and uh and we'll hear from from carrie about this uh about this particular passage from Phaedrus. Yeah, so it ties in nice to the video because um, it. I was just curious about one of the lines. I kind of fell down a wormhole about this. It got bigger since we last talked. But um, when Phaedrus turns to Socrates and he says, is this the spot where Arithia was carried away by Boreas? Um, Socrates, I know they mentioned it in that clip, but he says, um, it's a nice tale, but he's not sure if it's true or not, because there could be a bunch of other facts that we have to consider. Um, but he, it, there was one line that kind of got my attention. He said, he made a comment about allegories and how um, he is not to be envied who has to invent them. And that line to me was kind of like, that's an interesting thing, because an allegory is like a story that might have deeper meaning. And I think, I think it was kind of a voice of Plato just being like, oh, why don't you peek a little bit further into that? Um, so when I looked that up, the story is that Boreas wanted to marry Erythia, but she didn't want to marry him. So he ended up kidnapping her um, and kind of forcing himself to marriage. Um, and then so when once they got married, he felt bad about it and he gifted her father to immortal horses. And I just think like, I know a lot of the, uh, I know all of it's kind of played out through the voice of Socrates, but in my, the way I perceive this is it's kind of like, especially with the allegory line, it made it very about Plato, I feel like, because I feel like the line about not ending people who have to create these is, it made Plato's voice even stronger in that moment, I think, for me. Yeah, and that just, um, and it blew my mind. I didn't know there's so much of Greek mythology that I don't know. And so that that um, that detail, right, about the fact that uh, that she was gifted two immortal horses, and so the horses are kind of a bunch of 
fundamental role in this text. Um, and and you would never know that detail from reading the text. I didn't know that re detail from reading the text. Um, and uh, so, yeah. And, and do you know anything more about those courses? No, I couldn't really find um, any more. I have to dig deeper. But it's just amazing because that's literally like three inches of text out of the whole story. And if there's that much meaning behind just those three inches of text, I can only imagine what else is hidden in there. This is so true. So true. Yeah. I don't think it's coincidence, though. No, definitely not. And as he even mentions, I'm kind of waiting for uh, for Nick and Eric to jump in if you guys want. But um, uh, but yeah, it's uh, you know, he even mentions like there are other versions of the myth, right? And other versions she was carried off from the Areopagus, which has. I mean, Areopagus, uh, from from a Christian perspective, has a great deal of um, significance from Acts chapter fifteen. Um, and uh, but the Areopagus is a, is a place where the battles take place um, between the gods and uh, and whatnot, and where uh, Paul gives an important sermon. Um, but then, I mean, obviously that's not at play here. But um, but I think he's again emphasizing that like, well, whether or not the story is true is not the point right the point is the truth of the story and so um and so the truth of the story probably does have something more to, i mean it does have to do um another important detail that carrie brought up which is that um that orthria i don't know how to pronounce her name you know was forced right she was compelled um which i think many of us would would regard as a as an injustice as a form of violence um, against her and here as you were saying right um, Plato we hear Plato's voice coming through here right I mean uh, Lysias we, we um, I don't know if we'll have time to talk about Lysias's speech in particular but um, but it's it's very manipulative it's very Kevin Spacey-esque right it's a very Harvey Weinstein-esque it's very there's a lot of sexual harassment and a lot of sort of sexual violence that's being portrayed um through this and manipulation right um but and lysias was a real person he was a political leader but of course he didn't write this speech plato wrote this speech right and he put it in the in the pen of lysias and in the mouth of phaedrus but um but he's using phaedrus and you know phaedrus is the i phaedrus is the student in this text right you've got socrates the teacher you got um, Phaedrus as the student, and then you've got Lysias as sort of another teacher that's off, that's off screen, right? But it is manipulating the situation and twisting and perverting and and using his power um, to commit. I mean, of course, sexual harassment, but also just using rhetoric in a way to manipulate and deceive in ways that um, I think we just find all too often in our own world. Nick. I, uh... Yes, uh, actually, I think in what uh, what's actually happening in the news right now with uh, uh, the sex trafficking because of the boat was lodged, and now they're doing a full investigation and all of the cargo that was on there, and it's going to turn into something huge, it seems like. But uh, with that senator that is being accused of um, uh, sex trafficking or being linked to it through a 17-year-old, uh, it just... It it seems like all of the Plato can be taken in two different two different like sides. So like Plato can be like a coin. So you have like the positive aspect where your natural person, whoever you're talking to, is a more positive individual, and then you have the negative individuals that are just naturally that way as well. And then you very rarely see the neutrality of things where you're like there's always a glass half full or half empty, but never half. So when it comes down to like, so with the um, sex trafficking and the power that everybody has had, like that's brought everybody to this point, it's based off of, I believe in my mind, when it comes to like how it can be related to Plato is just the, the aspect of power versus the aspect of, um, I don't, what's the opposite of power, slavery. Disempowerment. So like, disempowerment. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. And so like it just 
we naturally sway as like humans more towards one side than the other. And then we kind of look at the other side. Like I happen to be a plucky ginger who's angry all the time, but with a smile on his face. So it's more along the lines of, I get the anger aspect and I don't understand why everybody's so happy sometimes. So if like, if Plato is anything, it's just two extremes on the same line. And um, a lot of the people that are not in power. So if like, if it's swaying more towards the, sorry about that. If it's swaying more towards the power aspect and they can literally do whatever they want, say whatever they want. And they will have the actual like leverage for people to believe it. And it's harder to believe an individual who is too like, I don't know how to put it. It just seems like we have a, it's, it's like a perception. So a while back when we were talking about the matrix, we were talking about Plato's cave being that little city that's under the ground. And then I mentioned how the robots were actually digging from their cave to that city, which is their own personal cave. So it's like two mindsets attacking each other in the middle, but one's trying to come for the other mindset more often than the other one trying to go get the other mindset. So it's like a constant battle between like one side of Plato and the other side of Plato. And there's never a not Plato moment of neutrality. Like there's never a 50, 50, it seems like it's always a 51, 49 or vice versa. And that's, mm -hmm. I've always seen that with Plato and all of the breakdowns and all of the stories. So it's not like a, it's not like a coin. It's more along the lines of it will sway either which way because we wholeheartedly see where Plato's coming from because he's describing the natural human so perfectly. But that's my good stuff. Yeah, and you sent me that um, snap. Uh, yeah, that uh, was twenty-two years. Um, twenty-two years since the Matrix came out. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, for those of you who haven't seen the Matrix or don't know, yeah, it came out on Good Friday. Um, 22 years ago, and uh, so yeah, it's, I mean it's it's an Easter story, right? Death and resurrection, baptism, um, but uh, and also allegory of the cave and lots of Plato. Um, but uh, Eric, you're never one short for words. I'm sure you got something to chime in here. Yeah, there's a there's a couple of things rolling through my mind, um, but I guess to keep it on point with what we're kind of talking about is um, similar to what Carrie pointed out just the intricacy of every word in this text. Um, and I was, when you were doing a little reenactment, the point where Socrates was like, oh, am I as destructive as Typhon? And I and I, I found that really interesting, I think, because I'm a history geek. So I've always viewed like mythology as a story of a people. You know, I kind of, you look at faith and religion and mythology as explaining how a group of people see the world around them and how they try to seek answers to questions for the time being. But I wonder now if maybe that was a misconception or maybe just one version of mythology. Maybe mythology is just as much an internal reflection about myself and how I view the world. And in that sense, it makes myths a lot more, and I say this word cautiously, but a lot more believable and also faith in general, because I may not have to understand the story so much. I may not have to believe in X amount of gods. I may not have to believe that... Um, Allah is the one and supreme being. But if I look at the text and I feel some type of way about it and I can see myself in a specific character or person or prophet, et cetera, then maybe that's the whole point of it. Um, I also find it incredibly interesting that he chose Typhon. You know, he could have chosen the great gods, the, the big heroes of the stories, you know, the ones that we all love and praise, but he chose probably one of the biggest antagonists of all mythology um, as a way to reflect on himself. Uh, so I'm kind of just playing with that in my head, and, and I'm not sure where I'm going with it, but it well, really just so, kind of shifts my idea. So, so can you say more about that? Because I, I will admit, like I said, I don't, I'm not, Greek mythology is just not something I've ever really focused or, or learned very much about. So Typhon is not, um, not really something, I don't know that story, and I know my kids who, you know, we want to keep our focus on the kids uh, here. I know that they don't know it. So, um, so yeah, what do you know about Typhon, that yeah. story? 
a pretty big Greek mythology geek and I've kind of st strayed away from it. So I probably, I may not get the story exactly right, but essentially there's the great big battle between the Titans and Zeus and his siblings, the gods and the Titans. At the era, the ruling... I think. Yeah. Yeah. I believe so. I think. <laughs> um, <laughs> and essentially I finish as one of these big Titans um, that was sent to try to destroy Zeus and the gods. And the way it's, the story's always been portrayed is that the Titans were the bad guys, right? Zeus and his homies, they're, they're the good guys. They're the people we're supposed to be rooting for. And Typhon is one of the guys that's been banished and sent to Tartarus for all to be tortured for all eternity. Um, so it's really strange then for Socrates, who's the big hero of Plato's story, to come out and say, oh, I'm not like Zeus. I'm not like Poseidon. I'm not like the big three. I'm, I wonder if I'm as destructive, if I'm as evil as this big antagonist, as the big villain. Um, which is such an interesting twist and such an interesting play on words. And because we always want to associate ourselves with the good guys, we always want to be the Supermans and the Spider Mans of the world. Except recently, I feel like even generationally, I think we're starting to relate more to the villains. I think if you look at uh, the Joker, a lot of people are kind of vibing with the Joker now. People are kind of like, hmm, you know, he kind of had a point. Or if you look at Thanos, a lot of people are like, you know what? Hey, Thanos is kind of on point. Um, so it seems like in the same similar vein to Socrates as a generation, as a group of people, we're kind of straying away from relating to the stories of the superheroes and starting to kind of look at these villains and say, you know, there's something to them. And I think that's a really interesting generational shift that we're starting to see. Yeah, no, I did not know all of that. Um, some of it was ringing bells as you were talking. I was like, oh yeah, I guess I have heard that story. But um, uh, yeah, I mean, he does... So he does. I mean, he he. Socrates references the Matrix here, right? Um, the um, well, I guess, or might be the other way around. But um, yeah. So you know, um, Neo of course goes back into the Matrix in order to visit the Oracle, right? Um, and so the Oracle, if you remember uh, from from the original movie, he goes to visit the Oracle, and she's baking cookies, and she's smoking a cigarette, and she's drinking fancy drinks cheers by the way and um and right over her door um one of the uh, there aren't many things in the matrix that annoy me but but it does annoy me that um that they have temet no say above the the door means no thyself um rather than nuisance sell time um, temet no say is latin which means know thyself but she's referencing the greek um, Oracle at Delphi who said, yeah, um, um, nuisance al taunt, know thyself, right? What's Matt, what he says uh, in this passage that, um, that we saw on the video, I have no time for such things. This is at paragraph 230. I have no time for such things, meaning is the story true or not? Did these things happen or not? Is the story of Typhon and Zeus and all those kind of things or, or Boreas and Orithria, are, are they true? Did they happen? Are they historical? Did um, George Washington really chopped down a cherry tree or, you know, those kind of things. Did it actually happen? And he's like, I don't have time for that kind of stuff. Who cares whether it's true or not? That doesn't, that's not the point. The point is not whether the story is true. The story is what, the point is, what is the truth of the story, right? And so you have these different character types. And so the truth of the story um, is, I'm still unable, as the Delphic inscription orders, to know myself, right? And it really seems to me ridiculous to go into other things before I have understood that, right? If I can't know myself, then why am I trying to figure out if something, you know, some story about Boreas happened or not? Why does it even matter? If I know whether it happened or not, does it help me to know myself or not? No. What help? But the stories, right, as Eric was saying, like the stories of... Um, of Typhon and these other things. It help us to understand, am I more like this character? What would I do? What, what am I more like, can I relate to Thanos? Can I relate to the, the Joker, especially Joaquin Phoenix version of the Joker, right? You can see like, yeah, man, I mean, I mean, he, he was kind of shaped uh, into the person he was by the world around him, you know, I mean, by his, by the abuse um, suffered upon him by his stepfather and all sorts of things, right? So, I mean, victims of abuse are psychologically damaged, and if they don't have any sort of psychological help but are continually beaten down on, then you can relate to them, right? You can understand that sort of deep nihilistic tendency um, because from their perspective, the world has no justice in it. Um, and so 
yeah, these, these stories do help us to know ourselves, right? So what matters is the truth of the myth and what matters is whether or not we can understand that truth and even more to the point, whether or not that truth informs our actions, right? Whether we take actions, whether those stories inspire us to know ourselves and um, not just to know ourselves, but then to define ourselves, right? Um, we are defined by our actions. What were we watching? Kids, I need to get my kids' voices in here um, at some point. I know they won't talk to y'all, um, but uh, what were we watching the other day? We were defined by our actions. Enola Holmes. Have you seen Enola Holmes? Um, fantastic, fantastic movie. Um, it's a Netflix original. It stars the the girl. I don't know her name, but from um, Stranger Things. She's brilliant, and she plays Melly Bobby Brown. And um, <clears throat> and she play. Yeah, this was a Leela suggestion. Um, watching this movie, and uh, she plays Sherlock Holmes' younger sister. Um. And, uh, but yeah, it, it may have been in that movie where they said, you know, we are defined not by our beliefs and not by our thoughts and, but we're defined by our actions, right? But it's not really a belief if you don't act upon it, right? Or, um, Cyrus, uh, Cyrus is, um, Cyrus is named after, um, King Cyrus of Persia, um, the emperor, but his middle name is James and, um, after his grandfather, but also after, uh, the brother of Jesus, and um, there's the epistle of James, which is in the New Testament, and there's a passage from the epistle of James, which says, you know, faith without works is dead. There is no faith without works. If your faith doesn't inform your actions, if you don't take actions as a result of your faith, then that's not faith, right? That's a dead faith. A living faith, a live faith, is that spirit that moves within and compels us to enact justice in the world, that compels us to live into those things. Those are what define us, right? So here too, Socrates is saying, right, these myths, these stories are what help us to understand ourselves and to know who I am. And who I am is going to be defined not by me sitting around thinking or talking to myself or reading philosophy, but who I am is going to be defined by my actions, right? So that, so I understand myself and, and how I fit into society, but that's all bullshit unless I can enact it, right? Rather than I put it into actions and bring it into being. I'm talking too much again. What do y'all think? I couldn't agree with you guys or with that concept. Anymore. I, um, I have always thought that there is more to movies or TV shows or books than a lot of people give them credit. Uh, I grew up in the day where nerds were getting still getting picked on and not running the world. So like, um, I, uh, it was kind of like in New Hampshire, it was kind of like made fun of a lot. And so we kind of verged away from that. However, my, my daughters, um, they watch anime. And ever since uh, the military, where I first learned about anime, um, I've watched very little of it, but somehow they're able to connect like mentally and emotionally to most youths nowadays in which they, they, they can emphasize in a drawing that's moving an emotion that we can't even really put words to. And so my 14 year old is, she'll be like crying cause a TV show, but then she'll talk about what it taught her. And it's just like blowing my mind that an anime, something at like uh, simple as Mickey Mouse is literally taking a generation and teaching them emotions, how to handle certain situations and giving people superpowers in a TV show and utilizing real world scenarios and still teaching. So it, was, it, it blows my mind that you have these artists that have found their expression of art that literally reach out to billions of children across this world and teach how to handle being upset through volleyball or something like that. So it's, I am a huge supporter of 
education through other conduits. So like TV, movies, um, sports, they have, they teach you willpower, morals, and, and some good, really good coaches teach you like more than just like the sport, but more like how to handle life events. So like, I think that uh, when it comes down to it, I think that there's a lot actually, if not everything that we see or witness is a learning moment at that time. So, but no, anime, my, my daughters love it and they've learned a lot, which is crazy. We have a lot of debates about it. It's so, it's so fun. If, uh, if Rachel, if Rachel were here, I know she would bring up the last airbender and, um, and, uh, yeah, we, we could do, we could dive into, into that at some point in the future too. Um, but you know, I had this, uh, I had this realization, I guess, I mean, similar to what is very similar to what Nick was just saying. Um, not, not, uh, not too many years ago where, you know, I started unpacking, I think it was, you know, when I was first starting teaching and, and using play, things like the good place and using, we use the different, um, show in your class, Eric, we, I think we talked about for the people. Um, I think we did for the people one semester and the good place the other semester. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, so many of these, you know, great works of literature and great works of, um, just, yeah, most things that are, I mean, a lot of things, right. Especially things that are, you know, if you're going to make a film, right, write a story and write a book and write a film, I mean, you're going to have so much, you're going to want to communicate what you've learned from life right? So you take, you write from your experiences that Mark Twain says, take what you know and write what you know and write about those experiences, which are always going to be experiences of life. And the best stories are the ones that communicate something to us or touch us because they reveal something about life. And so I think I've come to realize that when we're watching a lot of these things, whether it's anime or, um, or blackish or, you know, all sorts of, um, any sorts of, just about anything, right? Any sorts of um, artistic forms of expression, all these, there's still forms of humanities, right? They are teaching us about what it means to be human. And it's some, you know, there's always some writer or team of writers, but usually some sort of visionary or some writer behind it. And they're writing their experiences about life. And when we engage in it, whether it's anime or live action or whatever, right, we're, we're getting in touch with that author and their understanding of the world. And that's going to inform our understanding of ourselves and how we fit in. And, um, you know, I don't, I don't fit super well into academia. I think that's no I think that's no surprise. That's no big revelation there, right? I don't fit super well into academia. And part of it is that, you know, I mean, I can write academic texts. I can write, uh, I could write about all sorts of things that, you know, 15 people in the world would understand and eight of them would care about and the other seven would argue against me, right? But um, so I mean, I can do that. But what's the point, right? I mean, I think at some point we have to think about when we look around at the world, our world needs to be transformed. Our world needs to be changed. And if we have these, you know, super high conversations about all sorts of things, great. I and mean, that production of knowledge, I'm not knocking it, but at the same time, we need to, to face the public, right? We need to be in the agora. We need to be on YouTube. One of the things I've learned from my kids and from so many of my students is if it ain't on YouTube, it ain't real, right? I mean, if it's not on Wikipedia, it's not real. If it's not on Wikipedia or on YouTube, who the hell cares, right? Um, and so I think, um, I don't know, uh, y'all talk. I think that's single-handedly the greatest injustice of our current class structure. Um, growing up, I always heard the idea that education in the classroom was supposed to teach us how to be good citizens. And I think that's been misconstrued to mean good patriots. Um, and, but I don't think that's the point. I think the point is what you were saying earlier, which was kind of like my aha moment for the classes. As much as teaching is about the teacher or the student, it's also about how I then use what I just learned to view the people around me and my classmates. And I think, especially in college, that's gone. <laughs> I can't tell you much about my co my classmates. Why? Because I'm so focused on getting my grades. I'm so focused on passing that test, getting that GPA, and getting that degree. I don't have time to really look at what my what Carrie and Nick are thinking. 
because they don't matter to me. What matters to me is trying to get this grade so that I can progress. I'm sorry, Nick, but it is what it is, brother. You know how it is, you know, but that's the way that we've set it up. We've set it up so that like, you don't, right. you can't take time to kind of sit with what Nick and Kara are telling me because I'm thinking about what that final is going to be like. I barely understand what the professor is telling me. So how am I supposed to then think about my, my classmates? And we lose that. And I think that's why when we then go out to the big world and we go out to the adult world, so many of us are lost because we never really had to face what it's like to look at a, a person next to you. And we don't know what it's like to work with them if, if they agree with us, but then imagine if they disagree with us. Now we're like, oh crap, now it's a whole different world, right? And I think the benefit to the model that we've established in the religious quest in our class is that it forced us to not only listen to our, our classmates, but actually work with them in a space through the podcast. We had to look at their experiences, think about why they're saying it. Um, I like to, I love my podcast group because all three of us were entirely different, um, different personalities, different backgrounds, different in the things that we like. Um, but by the end of it, I can tell you who they were as people aside from our classroom. And that was an amazing experience just because I, one, I'm still, I still talk to them, which is great, but two, like I learned how to interact with people who normally I would never think I'd have anything in common with. And I became a better citizen because of that. Amen. So I have something to add to this because I I think that this is not just an issue in classrooms. This is like a big global issue that we're having right now that we're kind of in an empathy crisis um, because what's happening is like the internet is amazing. Like we're so lucky to have it, but we're so connected that it's causing a disconnect at like a physical and an empathetic level with our fellow human beings and our fellow like creatures. That's why... So we're cutting down rainforests and we're harvesting trees and stealing all the fish from the ocean. And it literally ties up to every crisis that we're dealing with in the world right now is because we don't connect as humans anymore. We don't need to figure out the cues from our fellow humans on how they're feeling or what they're going through because everyone's just behind a screen. So if you can't do that, if you also can't sit in yourself and kind of balance that darkness and sit and understand your own darkness you're not going to be able to understand if someone's having a bad day that they might it's okay to have to be in darkness for a day like without dark there's no light and I think it's causing this big issue I blame the internet for a lot of it but there's a huge disconnect but and the the pandemic is really just showing the scope of it I think the, the pandemic would, is revealing a lot. Yeah, sorry, Nick, go ahead. No worries. I would challenge how often you actually talked to strangers to begin with. Now mm -hmm. me, I'm the weird guy in the club where I will walk up to a person and talk to them, whether I know them or not, doesn't matter the color, the sex, the anything. I am that person. And then at the end of the conversation, which will probably be a very nice one, I will know a lot about that person. However, there's one thing that I've noticed in my years on this planet is that not a lot of people do that. And yes, we may feel the disconnect, but I think it's emphasized primarily because we have a big pandemic going on and we don't have any other, any other choice. But when we have the freedom to actually go forth and talk to people, do we actually take that opportunity to do said thing? And I would say 80% of us do not. So I it's more people, sorry, not to I think people are very afraid of feeling vulnerable. I think like a lot of these boil down to being vulnerable and people kind of it's like a gross feeling when you're sitting there and you're like, oh, I could go and talk to this person, but what if they're like rude to me or what if they don't understand me or what if they see me for the color of my skin and not for who I actually am? Like there's so many things that run through people's heads before they have a conversation. I wish the world was different, but I feel like we need people who are okay with just shedding their vulnerability and just like talking to humanity. It's, it's, yeah. So I totally agree with that. Even yeah, I think. Like, basically in class, right? Like how many, there's been so many moments where I know I'm, I have no goddamn clue what's going on, but I don't want to be the guy that's like, man, Mr. Doc B, I have no idea what's going on. It's an inherently vulnerable feeling. And, because we're not interacting with the people around us, because we're not interacting with our classmate in this social, academic space, 
we don't trust them enough to know that if I ask a dumb question, they're not going to laugh at me. That's what it is, right? That fear is like, I don't want to be laughed at. But if we're in a situation, if we're in a classroom and we're encouraged to work together and ask questions, I don't have that fear anymore. In the yeah. podcast, I never mind saying something stupid because I trusted the two people next to me that whatever I said, they were just going to take it with a grain of salt. But that's because we built that community together. And we don't right. have that in a lot of the spaces we're in. I personally, I, I, I really want to master communication because I'm one of those weirdos who really wants to change the world. And so I, I, I really think that if in order to literally talk to anybody who's always angry or considered angry, um, you have to be like a non ever triggered individual. And so that means that you have to be completely vulnerable and completely okay with it. And that's something that not a lot, it's, it's not easy. It's not fun. And that's probably why I'm angry a lot. But the thing is, is more, I know that I can bring that piece to a conversation, which I think anybody can. I think anybody can bring this piece. Uh, Dr. Van, you bring this piece so smoothly to any conversation. You, like you are a, an influence for me. And I just, I can walk into most things and just talk. So like it, it, it pretty much boils down to what, uh, if, if you think Plato on yourself, so if you break yourself down into the coin, into the positive Plato, negative Plato, neutral Plato, right? And you start breaking down every action before you actually do it, then you realize that vulnerability is pretty much out the window because you are being ridiculous at all times anyway, because we don't know a lot about anybody that's beside us. So any which way we look at it, it's it's more, I'm I'm putting out my personal feelings right now because it's not that I don't care what you all think about it. It's more on the lines of, if I don't live my truth, how are you guys going to know how to actually help me? Or how are you guys going to know how to be able to utilize me as a tool for your, your life to make it more positive or even help you out of a situation of an emergency? Like figure out English or French. I mean, like it's just, I, I don't think you need to speak a, sp a specific language in order to be able to communicate with somebody. So it's more- Amen. I think, <laughs> I just, I just think that I, I think Plato be, and actually this is Dr. Uh, Dr. Bannon brought this upon me. This was a while ago, but um, Plato with the whole entire, you don't find a lot of neutrality and there's a, probably a reason for it because it's, it's more neutrality covers multitudes of areas. So you can be neutral when it comes to, I don't know, uh, freedoms, but at the same time, you can't be neutral when it comes to somebody utilizing their freedoms over somebody else. So it's like you have to have a firm stance, but it's more towards, you know, it's like a shifting thing. So like a forever living because you're, you're a forever living and constantly changing things. So why wouldn't Plato be? So it's just, I think that every conversation is a learning unit. And I really want to know. No, I'm, absolutely. I think um... – we got a few more, five more minutes left, and I've got to do, I've got to dance. You know, I got to get a dance in here. Um, and it's a pirouette. Uh, do it in a second. But um, <laughs> yeah, it's gonna be awful. We'll see. We'll see. But um, but yeah, I mean, one of one of the reasons that Socrates, I mean, Socrates again, Socrates was a real person, but Socrates is primarily we know about Socrates as a character in Plato's writings, right? So it's Socrates as, I like to think of it as a voice inside of Plato's head, right? It's not Plato's voice, because Plato doesn't always agree with Socrates. Um, if you don't believe me, read the Phaedrus dialogue or some others. But um, but he's still a, a prominent voice, maybe the main voice, right? But but Socrates, in, at the end of the Phaedrus, you know, I mean, like I said before, he describes writing, um, especially philosophical writing or speech writing, as, you know, euphemistically to, to spill your seed uh, right on the parchments there's a form of masturbation right intellectual masturbation and um but that's not where seeds go seed needs seeds need to go in the ground seeds need to go in mines right so those intellectual when i pass these nuggets or plant these seeds um then those need those will take root right so i mean 
one of the things that I've I've learned over the years is that when I when I you know do like the 30 minutes like I did at the beginning of this, um, you know I'm planting those seeds and then they they go in your heads. But then what comes out is not what I said, but what comes out is something that something new, right? Something that's grown that's that's not my idea and it's not your idea, but it's our idea, right? It's an idea that comes and not just mine or yours, but something that comes from the conversation. From, from the dialogue, the discourse, right? So that's that's the other reason that Socrates says we can't have uh, we can't have uh, my parents are here um, that we can't have uh, we can't do philosophy through writing we can't do philosophy through books philosophy only happens in discourse philosophy only happens through dialogue right through conversations like this one which is wicked awesome by the way um, and. Uh, um, let me let me just um, I swear just reading this today this map that Lynn Mace Westfield made me do years ago on this book that I'm so grateful for uh, for assigning but um, reading these things I'm like gosh I I can't believe these ideas like it took me years to even understand them or to and I don't think I really understood them until I started putting them into practice and at some point probably foolishly thought they were my ideas but now i look back and i'm like no these were all none of these ideas that, that's another line from um from socrates we'll look at next week um where he says you know i'm just like an empty jar um it's been filled with the words and the thoughts of other people flowing in through my ears but i'm so foolish that i've forgotten who and from where you know these ideas have come and many of these ideas have come from my students and many ideas have come from my colleagues and from my my kids and from others around me right but um just a couple of things that are from my map of Bell Hook's uh, chapter on, um, I think it's chapter five. Um, but uh, she says, teachers and students have mutual responsibility for learning, right? Every, we both have mutual responsibility from learning. And then um, this other point, teach students how to listen and how to hear one another, right? And I think this is, uh, is um, well, of, of a few of you, right? I mean, Eric was saying, you know, when other people would say things in class and um, nervous about saying things in class, when uh, when sometimes when I when I teach and my when of course my classes are very discursive, right? I'm trying to get students to talk, and I noticed early on that sometimes some students they were just there for the grades. They only wanted to know what I thought so that they could write it down so that they would know the right answers on the test. And then when other students in the class were talking they would tune out. They just literally wouldn't listen, right? And then so, you know, some student in the class would say, like, I have the points. I want to make these points, but I want the students to make the points, right? So I'm trying to lead the students to make those points. And sometimes the students would make just these awesome points. They would say the points even better than I had planned to say them. But then other students in the class just literally wouldn't listen, right? Um, and I think that's one of the biggest benefits, the thing that I've learned most from the podcast assignment um, is just like Eric was saying, right? I mean, you you learn how to listen. You learn how to learn from one another. And that being in it together, that, or as Carrie, I think, was talking about, um, you know, teamwork, what you learn from sports and that kind of stuff. Um, or maybe it was Nick. I get, you know, but these ideas are all coming from all of us, right? Um, but we, we learn that we're in this together, or as, you know, um, one of my classes uh, at Fitchburg State used to, it might have been Gary's class, used to chant back at me and we would say, we only get out of the cave together, right? Or that mantra that I began this class with, Sahana um, Vavatu, Sahana Bunaktu, together, let us be protected, let us together be nourished by this learning. Okay, I uh, it, we're out of time, I'm over time. But um, so if you want to tune out, you can. But um, but I at very least I have to do this for my kids. So um, so we're gonna end on a really bad note. So here we go. Yeah. So I have to I have to do this uh, this pirouette dance. Take my shoes off. And um, <laughs> Nick Nick say no. <laughs> okay. Uh, all right. Let's see. How am I gonna do this? All right, I know that the thing is you got to look straight at the camera, right? So I'm going to lock on, right? And I might not do the footwork right, but I'm going to do the camera work right. Focus. Wait, you know what? I think I'll do better the other way. Oh, wait, I forgot the... I got to press this. Woo! <laughs>
Oh, that was gorgeous. All right. Gorgeous. <laughs> Working on it all week. Oh, you in? <laughs> Y'all, thank you so much for uh, hanging in there. And this was, this was awesome. This was, um, this was an amazing hour and 15 minutes. And um, so next week I'll, I'll post, I've got some more uh, features. I posted that other one finally today. Um, if you haven't seen it, um, feel free to dive in. So next week we'll talk about the little discourse after, after Phaedra reads the Lycia speech. There's some good stuff in there, like the empty jar, and then the first part of Socrates' speech when he gives his definition of eros or erotic love. So um, anyway, hopefully um, I will see the three of you back next week. And anybody else who wants to uh, to jump in here or hop in? Uh, anyway, see you all. Peace out. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much.